All right, so uh, let me go forward to where we were at yesterday. We left off. We we're going to talk about Bowen's reaction series, which I just passed. Somewhere around here. Here we go. Um, so we're going to talk about Bowen's reaction series. And I mentioned yesterday um, in lecture and on the video that I made of lecture um, about how Bowen was the guy who um, really discovered and described a process in which magma starts to solidify and what that does to your magma pool um, and how it changes. Um, and so basically the idea is when you have your big pluton, it's all filled with magma. Um, each of these different minerals that we learned about in the first chapter and the mineral chapter are going to crystallize at a different temperature. Um, so again, in the same way that water freezes at 32 degrees, um, it also melts at 32 degrees. Um, and so the freezing point is the same as the melting point. And although this is, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of degrees, um, freezing point still applies. It is turning from a liquid into a solid. Um, and so it's technically freezing, even though for us, it's still really hot. Um, that is the scientific term for what it's doing. It's freezing. Um, or if it makes you feel better, crystallizing. Um, so the first to crystallize is going to be your olivine and then pyroxenes and then plagioclases. Um, these are going to be the ones that make up, if we go back just one slide, these are going to be the ones that make up the these ultra rare ultra mafic rocks yes yeah yeah just plug the door um so these are going to make up these ultra rare ultra mafic rocks um olivine pyroxene plagioclase feldspar and we really don't see these very often in the rock record um they're there it's not like they don't exist we just don't find them too often so let me erase this just for a second and the reason for that is when you, here's your ground level, your surface, you have these nice big plutons that come in. And when your magma, get away, see that? Uh, when your magma starts to crystallize, the first crystals are going to be of that ultra mafic olivine, pyroxene, plagioclase, feldspar. So they're going to start to crystallize out. And then what's going to happen is the same thing that happens anytime you have a solid within a liquid. Um, the solid, by definition, is just more dense. Um, it, its molecules are packed together more tightly. Um, and even if it's made of the same material as the stuff that's surrounding it, it's more dense. And so these solid particles are going to sink to the bottom. Um, in lava, it may take a long time, but we have a long time. It's not going all the way to the surface. Um, these plutons cool over thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Um, it takes a very long time for that to happen. So um, they will eventually work their way down, and they will come down to the bottom and kind of just pile up at the bottom. Wherever your liquid area kind of ends, they will pile up. And so the issue is whenever we have uplift or whenever we have erosion, um, the reason we're not seeing these ultramafic rocks that are on the right side of that chart is that they're way, way far down. You'd have to have a ridiculous amount of erosion um, for, for us to be able to get those there at the surface. Um, even if you have uplift, you know, you might have your ground level come over here to this area, but you're still having your ultramafic rocks way down at the very bottom. Um, and so that's really what Bowen's reaction series describes. What comes out of solution first? Which crystals or which minerals crystallize first? as the cooling or freezing process begins. Um, and then what, what kind of order follows after that? Another thing to remember, when these minerals crystallize, your olivine, your pyroxene, your plagioclase, feldspar, um, they're going to take those elements out of the magma. Um, so whatever elements make up olivine and pyroxene and plagioclase, feldspar, usually uh, more metals and less silica uh, those are going to be gone out of the magma once they crystallize. Um, and so you see these two columns in your mafic, you have olivine. Um, in ultramafic, olivine is one of your dominant minerals, but after your ultramafic rocks are gone, there's just not a lot of olivine left. And so in the mafic, you see it as an accessory mineral. It's there. There's just not a lot of it. 
And then after that, you don't see it in either of the other two categories because all the uh, all the atoms, the the elements, yeah, all the elements that make up olivine are gone now um, because they've crystallized out in these first two columns. Um, and so if we go forward, we can see this is the the Bones reaction series chart, um, and what it describes on the left, you have your temperature. So here's your high temperature where everything is melted, um, about 1,200 degrees Celsius. Um, and then as everything cools down, you start to get your crystallization um, until you get down to about 750 degrees Celsius. Things are still hot, but mostly everything is solidified at that point. So um, what we start with, the first things to cool out are going to be olivine. Um, you're going to have a little bit of your pyroxene and a little bit of your plagioclase feldspar. Um, those are the things that make up your ultramafic rocks, which are pretty rare. Um, then... You get a little bit less olivine. So olivine is still there, but not quite in the same uh, uh, percentage as it is in the ultramafic rocks. You get more pyroxene, you start to get some amphiboles, um, and you have more plagioclase feldspar. Um, then, as it keeps going into intermediate, the olivine is, is all gone. Um, you don't have any olivine in your intermediate rocks. The dark pyroxenes are pretty much gone. Um, and you only, the only dark things that you're really getting are your amphiboles and your biotite mica. These are pretty much the last of the dark minerals that are left. Uh, you do still have some plagioclase feldspar, but notice that this is like a gradient. So at the top, you have more calcium-rich plagioclase. Um, and then as it goes down, the calcium gets drained out of the magma, and you have less and less calcium until you get down here, and it's more sodium-rich. Um, so once the calcium's gone, um, the sodium-rich plagioclase starts to crystallize. Um, and then when you get down to the felsic granitic rocks, um, where your granite and your rhyolite are, your pink rhyolite, um, there's almost no dark minerals. You might have a little bit of dark biotite and a little bit of amphibole, um, but you have potassium feldspar, um, muscovite, and quartz, which are all light-colored minerals, um, which is why these bottom rocks are light. Um, and so as – let me come back over here – as your magma chamber crystallizes and you start to fill up, um, what you're going to have is you're going to have your ultramafic rocks down here. That's bad handwriting at the bottom of the board. Um, the next layer, you'll get your mafic rocks. The next layer, you'll get your intermediate. Oh. I think it's because I'm writing out in front of me instead of like dragging it back towards me. Uh, and then up here, you get your granitic or felsic rocks. I'll put felsic. No, oh, S I C, felsic. Um, and so that's the reason, one of the reasons that granite is one of your most common rocks at the surface is because when it cools underneath the surface, it's at the top. It's literally the first thing that we see. And if you only have a little bit of erosion that happens over time or just a little bit of uplift, the only rock that's going to be exposed is granite. Um, your intermediates and your mafix are going to be much further down in the column as they kind of pile up in these different layers that happen. And so that's the idea behind Bones Reaction Series. Um, and so two things to remember. Each of these different mineral sets that make up these four different types of compositions for igneous rocks cools at a different temperature. Um, and then the other thing to remember is once that set cools, it has taken that set of elements out of the magma. And so now the magma that's left over for the other rocks is a different composition than when it started. Um, so when the mafix cool, it takes even more elements out. When the intermediates cool, it takes even more elements out. And so by the time you get to granitic, um, you have a very limited amount of elements uh, to form these last few uh, chemicals here, or not chemicals, these last few minerals here in your, your magma chamber. And so it all kind of fits together in this nice, like, chemistry puzzle, um, which is really nice and neat. It, it's, it explains things so well. Uh, it's one of the nice things about, uh, about geology is when you can just look at something uh, see a chart, which we have some great charts in geology. Um, you know, there's there's other sciences 
we see these charts and we're like, what is even going on here? Um, Joji has real nice knee charts, and I think this one explains it pretty well. You have your four different um, composition types for your igneous rocks, felsic, intermediate, mafic, um, and then the ultra mafic, which we don't see too often. You have your temperature on the left, which shows everything cooling down, um, and you have your individual minerals that make up these rocks, um, and you can see kind of how they, they come out in the magma and crystallize at different temperatures uh, and, and leave the, the leftover magma that's left that hasn't cooled yet um, with only the elements left to make the rocks that are needed. So it, it is nice and neat, a nice little package with a bow on top. So um, why would it be unlikely to find olivine in quartz in, in an igneous rock? Um, because the olivine is going to, excuse me, olivine and quartz in one igneous rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right. um, the olivine is going to crystallize very early on. Um, the olivine is going to crystallize at a very different time um, than the quartz. The olivine is the first thing to crystallize. The quartz is the last thing to crystallize. Um, and you can kind of see that here. Olivine crystallizes up here. Quartz is way down here. They have no overlap. And so the likelihood of you finding them in one rock is not very, uh, not very high. Uh, technically, it could happen, but that rock would have to cool very quickly um, without any time for the olivine to kind of settle out um, before the quartz cooled. And, that, and in that case, your crystals are probably so small, um, you, it would be difficult to identify the olivine in the quartz. It would probably be like a volcanic glass um, where you just have ions kind of separated instead of actual crystals. Um, so that's what they describe here. Here's your uh, igneous pluton. Everything is nice and melted. It starts to cool from the outside in. And as it cools, they kind of illustrate these uh, crystals falling down and kind of settling down at the bottom of the magma chamber. Um, so the magma that's left over is going to be more, uh, more silicate rich and have more of a chance of having quartz and, and granitic components as opposed to mafic components. So, nice. And also, what's left, the last thing that's left over here, if it's a volcanic uh, intrusion, is it's going to be your, uh, your granitic, your silica-rich magma that actually gets pushed up to the surface, and all the mafic stuff is kind of left over there at the bottom. So, uh, how are igneous rocks classified? We talked about this yesterday. Um, wait, yeah, 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 crystal size. We call this texture. That kind of threw me off for a second. Um, we call this texture. They've been calling it texture. It is kind of crystal size, but it's not all crystal size because in glassy, you don't have crystals. Um, in vesicular, it's more about the holes that are in there. Um, the other three are crystal size. So this is texture and chemical composition. In texture, we have the five. We have coarse grain, fine grain, porphyritic, which is both coarse and fine, glassy, which is just like a, a microscopic, uh, you know, ions and atoms mixed together in a glassy form, not really crystals. Um, and then vesicular is going to have the holes. And then your chem chemical composition, pretty much it's just the three. Um, you have granitic, which is the lighter colored stuff, uh, andesitic, which is the intermediate middle colored kind of light gray, um, and then basaltic, which is going to be your dark colored. And then there is ultramafic, but we don't see too many of those. Um, and how is the size of crystals in the igneous rock related to cooling rate? The larger the crystals are, the slower it cooled, and the longer they had to grow. Um, therefore, smaller crystals mean faster cooling, more likely a volcanic rock, where your larger crystals mean um, intrusive cooling. It never really got to the surface. It cooled underground. So now they're going to talk about weathering. Um, the reason we have to talk about weathering is because we're going to sedimentary rocks. Um, so once a rock gets to the surface, um, and let me point that out, it's got to be at the surface. You're not going to have any weathering um, or any creation of sedimentary rocks below ground unless you're talking about a cave. And really, if you're talking about a cave, it's close enough to the surface um, to kind of get a pass on that. Um, but weathering has to happen at the surface. Um, weathering is the transformation of a rock uh, to reach equilibrium with its environment. Um, and this is actually gets into a physics concept. Um, and so I've probably mentioned this before. Uh, geology pulls from all the different sciences. Um, we just had, with Bowen's reaction series, a, a, a chemistry talk, essentially, of how elements cool. 
um, and how it changes the chemical composition of the lava as each different type of mineral uh, solidifies. Now we're going to get into weathering, um, which essentially is going to talk about physics and, and what is the best physical shape for something. Um, and when you get down to it, everything wants surface area. Um, so mechanical weathering is the process of bringing down rocks into smaller pieces. Each piece retains the same physical properties of the original. Um, it wants to increase the surface area available for chemical weathering. And that's kind of what happens. They even show squares here. Um, but in general, the most surface area per volume is a, is a cube. Uh, not a cube. I'm so sorry. Is a sphere. There's a cube up here. So my brain is short circuited. Um, and so everything will eventually also go to round. They show it going to smaller pieces because they cut these up. And this is probably even just computer animated. I doubt they actually cut this. Um, but um, smaller pieces get you more surface area. Round pieces get you more surface area. And that's what physics really wants to happen. Um, that's, that's the way that it wants things to work out, um, which is why weathering kind of occurs. And so this block has four by four square units. Um, so, or four square units, it's two by two. Uh, they're 24, wait, 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 what are they doing here? Six sides, one cube, 24, 48. Um, basically what I think they're trying to show you here is all three of these piles are the same volume. Um, you have two by two, you have one by one, and then you have uh, a half by a half. Um, but I think if you stack these all up into a cube, um, they're going to be the same volume of rock. They've just cut them into smaller and smaller pieces. And they're showing you that with the smaller and smaller pieces, you're getting more and more surface area. Um, and so the smaller your pieces you get, the more surface area is exposed to the weathering. Um, and it just kind of increases um, your weathering uh, effects. So it goes faster and faster and faster. So let me go back and make sure I didn't miss anything on this one. Um, it is a natural response of minerals to a new environment. And there are two basic categories of weathering. Mechanical weathering, which is the one we're most familiar with, and then chemical weathering, um, which we were kind of introduced to as, as children as uh, like acid rain and pollution causing acid rain, um, which isn't necessarily, um, I mean, it does happen, um, but really think of chemical weathering as water. Um, water is considered the universal solvent. Given enough time, water will dissolve almost anything, um, even rocks. So. Um, both of these generally occur simultaneously unless you're in a very unique environment. Um, and then erosion is the transportation method. So weathering is going to break it down. Erosion is going to move it. Okay, so first type of mechanical weathering that we have, this is frost wedging. Um, we don't get a lot of frost wedging here in Texas um, because we don't get a lot of frost. Um, every once in a while, uh, we do get some snow ice. We don't really get snow. We get snow ice. Uh, you can't drive your car on it. You can't really make a snowman or snowballs. If you make a snowball here and throw it at somebody, it's going to hurt. Uh, but every once in a while, we get something close to it. But up north, and especially when you have the mountains, um, you get frost wedging. And the idea is we all know this from trying to put like a soda bottle in the freezer. And if you forget about it and leave it in there too long, um, ice expands. Um, when water freezes, it expands. And so you get water that goes down into a little crack in a mountain or in a rock or in your street. If you have a crack in your street, um, the water will expand when it freezes. It will push that crack open. Um, the next time it rains and freezes, it'll do it again. And your potholes just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, or your cracks get bigger and bigger and bigger until your rocks fall off the side of the mountain. Um, and then weathering has begun. Um, and then that piece that falls off will get broken down into smaller pieces and smaller pieces and smaller pieces until it becomes sand at the beach and it fulfills its destiny. Um, that's essentially what all weathering is trying to do. Take the stuff that's up high, move it down to sea level at the ocean um, and beyond down to the ocean basin. Um, some things get stopped in valleys, some things get stopped in lakes, um, but in general, uh, weathering is trying to move everything downward and flatten everything out um, until we get to Waterworld. Has anybody ever seen that? That movie gets a lot of hate, but it's a pretty good movie. I like Waterworld. Uh, so um, I, ice expands 9% when it freezes, which helps everything push out. Um, it is most pronounced in the mountain regions, 
um, in your middle latitudes where you have some good freezing. Uh, we don't have either one of those things, mountains or freezing. So um, not super common around here, but it does happen. Um, then we get sheeting. And I kind of explained sheeting uh, when I talked about uh, enchanted rock. Um, so this is the kind of sheeting that enchanted rock ha happens. And it, it creates the sounds that actually gave enchanted rock its name. Um, so you get your deep pluton. It cools down. Um, you have confining pressure of all the rock and sediment above it. So um, millions and millions and millions of pounds pushing down on it, helping to hold it um, in place. And then something happens, you have uplift or you have weathering that takes all of that sediment off. And what's left over is this rock, which used to be really squeezed. And now there's nothing squeezing it anymore. And so it's going to expand. And when it expands a little bit, it's not expanding a lot like frozen water or anything, um, but you do have expansion. And it starts to get these cracks at the surface. Um, and these cracks will uh, pop off different pieces of rock. They will start to slide down the sides. Um, and you'll get that sheeting effect. Just for example, I'm going to Google Enchanted Rock and show you all what's up. Enchanted Rock. Hopefully, I don't get some weird crystal picture. So, this rock is enchanted. So here, this is Enchanted Rock in Texas, um, and you can see the nice sheeting that's going on. So these are like really big pieces of rock. Um, if you go up to this, this edge right here is probably a good like at least six feet, maybe like 10 to 12 feet. I don't, I don't, you can see some of them are kind of thin. This one, you could probably stand on this and not be able to touch <laughs> the edge up here. Um, and so this is a really good example of sheeting. Um, this is also a good example. What is, is that a person? No, I don't know. Uh, this is a really steep rock. Uh, I don't know what y'all's uh, exercise level is, but it's probably a good 30 minute at least trek up to the top, if not a little bit more. Um, and so it looks small from this picture, but uh, once you get going up there, it's a good little hike. Um, but yeah. That's, that's a really good example of sheeting and how it starts the weathering process. Um, because this is a, a solid piece of granite right here. And it's going to take a long time for just wind and water uh, to start to break it apart. And so you can see the layer underneath that's not sheeting um, doesn't really have a lot of erosion going on or weathering going on. Um, but this top layer that has cracks, you can see there's missing a whole bunch of this layer. They've all kind of fallen down. And you don't even see a bunch of the pieces down here at the bottom. It's not like there's a pile of what's left over this layer. Once they break off, it really starts the, the weathering process uh, to, to advance that. And uh, I mean, you can find some of these pieces down here at the bottom, but uh, it's not like they're all there in their original form. So yeah, that's Enchanted Rock. If you ever get a chance to go by there, it's good. And then stop in Lano, get some delicious sausage, um, barbecue. Uh, this place, Inman's, has turkey sausage, which sounds gross because I don't even like ground turkey, um, but it's delicious. So that's my two cents for the day. Um, so yeah, that's uh, sheeting. Continued weathering uh, results in exfoliation domes. Uh, I don't really know what they mean by exfoliation domes, but I think we just kind of see it here. So yeah. And then biological activity. This is actually a great picture. Um, you have the tree growing out of the rocks here. Um, and you can see what the tree is doing. It's sending its roots down in any cracks that it can find. Um, these cracks are going to hold water a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit better than just the surface of the rock. Um, also, if there's any sand or, or dirt um, or weathering of these rocks, it's going to fall down in there and kind of hold some nutrients for the tree. Um, so the tree can survive there. Um, but as it grows, it's going to push everything out uh, and, and cause this rock to kind of break apart. Um, it may not fully cause the rock to fall over, um, but it's not helping for sure. Or, I mean, it is helping for sure. Uh, and it's going to allow more and more water down in there to help the weathering process happen even faster. Um, this is just one example. Anytime you have plants anywhere, their roots are going to go down. They're going to find cracks. They're going to push stuff open. Uh, and, and plants are a real big part of, of kind of breaking up the rocks that are just below the surface. 
Burrowing animals do expose rock to increased weathering. They can't really burrow through hard rock, um, but they allow water uh, to get down there to kind of help along with the process. So now we move on to chemical weathering. Um, and for the most part in chemical weathering, we're going to be talking about what oxygen is doing. Um, you can have different uh, chemicals in your oxygen. So a carbon dioxide dissolved in water is called carbonic acid. Um, that can kind of help things along. Um, but that's not always a, a common thing to happen. Um, we talk about this with pollution um, and acid rain. Um, but in general, water will pretty much dissolve everything. So chemical weathering alters the internal structure of minerals, not just the external structure. Um, elements are removed or added, and the original rock is transformed into a new stable material. Um, oxygen dissolved in water causes ox oxidation. So we see that with metals that we leave outside. Um, rust is oxidation. Um, it starts to break the metals down. It turns them into a new chemical. Um, instead of iron, you'll get iron oxide. Um, I don't know the chemicals for like uh, oxidized copper and, and silver, but um, it happens with almost every metal. Um, you can get oxidation in some sort of uh, weathering. Now, one of the ones that doesn't happen to, uh, gold. You can leave gold wherever it's at. It's not ever going to rust. It doesn't tarnish. Um, that's one of the reasons we like gold so much and like to make things out of it. Um, so oxygen dissolved in water causes oxidation. Carbon dioxide gives you carbonic acid. And obviously acid is going to help dissolve things. Um, this is abundant at the air surface. And the interaction with the minerals changes their crystal structure. Um, your feldspars get broken down into clay minerals, which is great for soil. Um, silica is carried away by groundwater, which can result in quartz forming. Um, one of the things that we see, like when you have, uh, I've already moved them over there, those nice big uh, six-sided quartz crystals, those form from water that has dissolved the silica away and gone into a, a cave or some sort of void down in the ground. Um, and then the quartz crystal is allowed to grow in free space. Um, you really won't see too many um, six-sided quartz crystals that just come straight out of a rock. Um, usually you have to have that empty space where your quartz-rich water is, is kind of feeding it and allowing it to grow. Hello? Yes, I do. Yeah, no problem. You want to go see Miss Jones? Sure. You could just be like, no, Mr. Bailey was teaching, and I don't, I didn't get a chance to go. But yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you probably can. There's only a couple minutes left. I don't know how long it'll take, but. And then uh, what do we have? Products of weathering. Uh, so they're just kind of showing you what happens when it gets dissolved by water. So if you have quartz. Um, the residual products of quartz grain and what minerals in the solution? Silica. Um, for feldspars, you get silica, potassium, sodium, and calcium, which are all good for soils. Um, so this helps with your clays. Um, also clays, I think, usually have a uh, good aluminum content. Um, amphiboles, get your clay minerals and iron oxide, silica, calcium, magnesium. Um, and then olivine gets you more iron oxide, silica, and magnesium. So uh, I think we're going to leave off here today. What do we have? Like five minutes, maybe three minutes. Yeah. Uh, seven minutes. Really? Then maybe I'll just keep going. Try to get as far as we can. Uh, as long as we're done with this, we will we'll have some free time tomorrow. Uh, I might introduce the lab a little bit. I'm not used to this new time schedule here. 827. Maybe. Yeah, I guess so. We'll see. Okay. Um, so now they're going to talk about how to form sedimentary rocks. We talked about weathering um, and essentially creating your sediment. Um, then you're going to have some sort of erosion happen, and your sediment's going to be brought to a new area. Um, we will get to erosion, I think, more detailed in the next chapter when we talk about water. Um, we're going to talk about rivers and streams and moving of sediment. Um, they will touch on it lightly here. Um, but basically, your sedimentary rocks need to have that lithification. They form after weathering breaks the rock down. Gravity and erosion move them to a different place and deposit that sediment. And then the sediment becomes lithified. So the lithification is really what you need to create the rock. Um, sedimentary rocks, although we see a lot of them, especially around here, 
um, they're not a huge part of the rock record. Um, they're only about 5% of Earth's outer 10 miles, um, but do account for 75% of all continental rock outcrops. Um, because in general, everything that's above the ocean is currently being weathered into sediments. Um, and so um, it, it, it's not a huge part of the crust, but it's a, a large part of the surface because that is what's happening at the surface as far as we can see. Um, you know, if you're underground, you're getting a different type of, or not underground, sorry, underwater, um, you're getting a different type of sedimentary rock. And if you go back into Earth's history, uh, you'll probably have a little bit less sedimentary and a little bit more igneous. Um, so sedimentary rocks are important for geology, and this is like an understated bullet point. Um, they're important because they're used to reconstruct details about Earth's history. Sedimentary rocks are the history book of Earth. Um, and we literally look at them in that way. Every single layer is like a page in Earth's history. Um, and so when you go out there and you go uh, out there, just in general there, uh, like if you go to the uh, Grand Canyon, you will just see layer after layer after layer. Um, and if you get up to one of these sheer cliffs and look even closely, um, you will see like smaller layers within these. Um, these are literally pages of the history book. Um, they're not written down with words. They're written down with actual materials. Um, sometimes there's pages missing, um, but there is a lot of information to be gained about these. Um, and usually these layers will go halfway across the country. Um, a lot of the towns that we have in Texas and all over the United States are literally named after the geologic uh, uh the geologic layers and sometimes vice versa the layers are named after the town um that that you have this actually come up to the surface instead of it being 200 feet underground it comes to the surface in uh green texas or groon or however you pronounce it and they call it the groon formation um and so this is like the history before we started to write down our own history um and even sometimes those layers contain uh human civilizations that didn't really have writings or their writings didn't survive um and so we kind of dig them out um you're not finding any dinosaur bones or any human settlements um or anything in igneous rocks um, igneous rocks have been melted um they destroy all evidence of what happened other than the melting and the igneous uh process itself sedimentary rocks preserve stuff um these are these are very interesting all your dinosaur bones uh, all your arrowheads, all your uh, footprints. If you've ever been down to Glen Rose and see the dinosaur footprints down there, um, those are sedimentary rocks. Uh, that is Earth's history. Um, and for me, it's the, it's the cool stuff. I, I don't like history, history. Uh, I, just, I mean, there's interesting stuff that happens, but got to remember everybody's name and dates and all this stuff. Uh, geology, you can get like... You ever in history class, you're like, I don't know. It happened in the 1800s. Um, and, you know, they're like, no, you need to know the specific date. Geology, yeah, it happened in the 1800s. It happened like a million years ago. Good enough. Like, we don't know the exact dates. But just give me a time frame and you're good to go. Um, also, a lot of sedimentary rocks have economically important stuff. Um, coal is a sedimentary rock. All of your petroleum and natural gas are found in sed sedimentary rocks. Um, a lot of your metals, we can find metals um, in igneous rocks. They're extremely difficult to, to extract um, and usually not very concentrated. Um, the, the gold rush in, in San Francisco and California um, and even up in Alaska, um, you're looking for gold in these sedimentary rocks. You're panning rivers. Um, you're doing stuff like that. Uh, fertilizer, construction materials, et cetera. Um, there's lots of economics in sedimentary rocks. So they take you back to the rock cycle to kind of reemphasize um, where your sedimentary rocks are. Your sediments being deposited here. There's your sedimentary rocks. Um, what are they talking about now? Detrital sediments versus chemicals. So this is where we will leave off today. Um, these are your two types of sedimentary rocks, and we will deal with these and the differences between detrital and chemical. Just to kind of hammer this home, think of detrital as like detritus. It's like uh, when I think of detritus, I think of like your skin cells coming off when you like scratch your arm, it sounds gross. But uh, that's that's really what the term detritus means is like little pieces that kind of fall off. 
um, versus chemical, which is like your, your elements being dissolved. So uh, live long and prosper at home for anybody who's watching this and y'all have a nice day.